Welcome to this session where we will be looking how to migrate to Data Vault Builder. So let's assume you have created your solution already, either manually or one of the tools that are there on the market for automating Data Vault. And you realize the Data Vault Builder has a broader scope, has a lower total cost of ownership, and you want to migrate towards Data Vault Builder. So how to do that? Let's have a look on what our assumptions are, what the ways to achieve this. And our main target that we see here is that we want to integrate data. And that's why we create a data world. We want to harmonize data. We want to historize data and deliver it in a very good quality to the data consumer. And this is what all the solutions try to achieve with more or less effort. So this webinar is covering generally how to migrate to Data Vault Builder. We will just use one sample, Automate TV. And this is not because we think Automate TV is like bad or something, but because we value that Automate TV is broadly used by users and we have requests from this side to migrate to Data Vault Builder, but it would apply as well to other commercial tools, to self-created tools created with maybe some Excel repository or database repository that you have created. And what we need is from these existing solutions to get a list of hubs, links, satellites, source system, tables, business keys, attributes, all the stuff that we want to then generate with the data vault builder. And the funny thing is that most of it you will find as well in a third normal form warehouse, maybe not using the business keys, but that's a different aspect. So you could take your existing to a normal form solution if you know about the entities, the primary and foreign keys, and at least create a source vault automatically out of that. And this could be a starting point to then slowly model out as well the business key part and create a proper raw vault. So what is the approach that we recommend? We call this the migration vault and it's called the migration vault because we're using the same approach that we use to integrate data to migrate the metadata from your existing solution to the data vault builder. So we have created in the data vault builder itself, which is model driven automation tool, a data model about metadata. So we have in here the hubs, the hub loads, satellites, links. We have links where they connect from and to. We have different loads, columns, source system information. So everything that you need to describe the different layers of your data vault can be captured in here. If there is something that you want to add, it can be extended to as well capture maybe business rules, interfaces, stuff like that. But honestly, we kept it in the first step here in the example pretty simple because for from many systems, we received the information that we have here on this picture. But as example, we don't receive interfaces like the way out of the business world uh, of the raw vault and the business world as in a structured format. So the main idea is that we will go and we will extract the existing metadata. This can be files, this can be access to a database. And as we're using the data vault builder that is able to connect to many systems, we can use the connectors to connect to SQL Server, Oracle directly, query the metadata in the database, maybe query the information schema of the database if there's some information maybe hidden in the naming that you used. And map it then to standard objects in the data model. Why we do we need the model in between? Because as example, if we generate an ID for a hub, we want to reuse it as well in the satellite and reference it in the link to reference it and stuff like that. And this will allow us automatically while accessing the data through the APIs created in the data vault builder to get this kind of information. And the target that we want to achieve is generate a deployment package. It's not directly installing the metadata that we extracted into an environment. Why that? Because usually this kind of migrations don't work in the first go. That's pretty obvious and normal. So you can create here version zero, version one, two, three. And as this is a deployment package, you can then deploy just the changes to your test environment and see exactly how it changes and what are the next steps. So you see directly the impact of you like your source mapping to the target model you're creating. And now 
For this example, I will concentrate on DBT with Automate TV as an example. It could be anything. It's not like specially highlighting that. It's just that DBT is widely used. So there are more people asking about it. So that's why we go into the details. And the first thing that I want to highlight is that there are a lot of similarities between the tools. So we're solving the challenge of prepare data for our analytical purpose. We can create a data vault core. We can create a historization and harmonization of data. We can create business rules. And what I like to highlight about DBT, because this is a tool that really good solved it. And honestly, we are probably the only two tools on the market that solved it really in a way where you can branch, merge your code and do distributed development, that this is the same in DBT and the data vault builder. They do it more in the similarity to the code. They use this SQL templates. They call them models, which they are not, but that's just a, a phrasing. We use the logical description of objects like hubs and links and stuff like that. But we use exactly the same Git flow based approach. And this is, in my opinion, the only valid approach today to version your code to work agile to do distributed development. You have involved tools, lineage information at entity level that you can access, export. You can create documentations out of that as you like. And you get with, and this is now in combination with Automate TV, ready to use data vault patterns. So no difference there. You can include materialized and virtual layers. And very nice for both tools, they work on-prem and in the cloud. And here again, if you go for an on-prem solution, it's probably not much choice you have. You have probably the DBT solution, some older tools that are not cloud native, or use the Data Vault Builder. Because the difference is to all the tools with DBT and the Data Vault Builder is that both work on-prem, but you can simply transfer them to the cloud because they are built in a cloud-ready manner. So where are then the differences? Why would you switch? And please consider this is a biased view. So there might be as well a lot of reasons to take a different choice. I'm working for Data Vault Builder, so I'm highlighting our perspective. And if you want to switch, most probably what are your points to, to, that you have evaluated. So DBT is a code-driven approach. So it starts from the bottom and goes up. We are starting model driven. So we start with a business model and we generate out of that code. So it's a completely different approach. It's not bad or uh, not uh, better or worse one or the other. It depends on what you need, but we believe that in the long term, the model driven approach is the better one for our clients. Uh, the second thing is they focus mainly on T, so they don't have like extraction building. You can combine it with other tools like you can cover nearly everything that we do in dbt by adding other tools to to fill in the gaps and the data vault builder covers etl and elt in the tool so you can go really from source to the moment you deliver the data to the reporting layer and this is exactly what i mentioned here so you can and you need to combine dbt most probably if you want to get the working solutions to cover all the functions that you want to do with other tools like airflow airbyte flyway for the deployment and maybe a model tool if you want to highlight and show uh, how the data is connected. In the Data Vault Builder, you get all of these tools included covering everything. Still, you're able to combine it with other tools as we have APIs in every layer, but you don't have to. You can just work with the database and Data Vault Builder and you're good to go. Uh, by the way, this is one of the most mentioned aspects why people migrate to the Data Vault Builder. Here, both of them are able to create deployment scripts, uh, but it could be that you use, uh, you need to do uh, forward and backward scripts manually for certain changes of certain objects if you have already data loaded and use tools like Flyway to version that to create your reverse script. In the Data Vault Builder, it generates you all the scripts of all the changes that you can do in one environment as well for the deployment. Again here, for creating here new objects, it's perfectly fine. DBT will generate you out of the box, will load them, everything. But when you start with the changes, you will save here considerable cost by not needing to write the script yourself. Then in DBT, 
you have certain different free patterns like automate tv there are other providers offering you patterns you can bring your own and that's very open so you can install whatever patterns you want you can create different styles of data vault you can create as well turn on form uh, core layer you can't do that in the data vault builder but the approach that we support with a raw vault core with business vault with creating interfaces denormalizing everything creating business rules everything that you need including historization by temporality operations is included and maintained over time what does this mean that people that started 2012 with the data vault builder with the original sql server version still are able to upgrade to the newest version because we don't deliver them just new patterns because sql server changed over time but as well the update scripts we do the same for oracle snowflake for all the database platforms we support and what people gave us as feedback when they changed the data vault builder is they were so happy that they don't need to repeat a lot of the coding they do a lot of the metadata in uh, descriptions like if you have in one layer your comments already captured that you need to transport them forward to the raw vault to the next layer this is done automatically in the data vault builder so if you have something on your staging table you use this in a satellite and then you use it for the output the comments on top of this columns will be transported forward if you look more uh, at the data vault part so yes you get basic data vault patterns here if i say basic they are already covering a lot of stuff but here in the data vault builder we are adding more and more stuff like bitemporal loads like cdc load like using snow pits by patrick kuba and this is exactly what we do so we are looking on the market which kind of modelers and people add to the knowledge and we're extending our patterns getting feedback optimizing performance and adapting it to the changing databases you can do all of them here yourself because it's open but you have to do it here you get it with the tool and the update update script for existing physical implementations you can preview in the DBT certain steps. You can preview a SQL that you're writing, so you can generate directly the code it will be creating and press a button and preview that as well. Here in the Data Vault Builder, we are not doing it just for one layer. It means as soon as you change something in the model, you can review the full stream, you can start loading data, you can see how historization happens without recreating the whole model or redeploying something. It's just there documentation lineage is always up to date operations jobs are adapting so it's covering much more in real time because you're working in the data vault builder directly with the underlying database in your sandbox this means immediately when you change the model you see the results in dbt you need to create manually you the output of your raw vault or business vault here in the data vault builder based on your business model you can visually select what you want to output you select the temporal perspective is it as of now as of then you can output cdc data based on different timelines that's how you can automate that as well so for me and that's my personal opinion i think dbt addresses developers and data engineers very well our approach is to bring data engineers and business users together because we believe that we are solving a business problem and business users should define their requirements and we should give them fast feedback they should be able to understand what is happening because even if you create a perfect dbt solution you need to communicate it to the business users and this is what we are doing through the simple visuals through including them in the build process and i think this adds a lot of value now let's go a little bit away from technology let's look at the business value so big point for dbt is when you start you have lower license costs dbt core is free period data vault builder comes at the cost you license it for your company and you can use it on many different machines and everything but you need to get at least a license for your company you have community support here you have support included on the data vault builders and by the way i'm here really comparing the dbt core version in the free version you can as well buy from dbt different other versions i'm not familiar with them so if you are interested in that feel free to contact them visit their web page uh, so you get community support here you get support included so you can open a ticket you get replies as we are very standardized we can really look at your data model reproduce it on the version that you have without any bigger issues 
On DBT side, you need additional tools. So add them to the pricing and not only the licensing for them, but as well setting them up, operating them, updating them, creating interfaces between them. And I think that's the biggest difference. And honestly, on most of the projects, you will spend here more than the cost that you pay here for the license. We're replacing up to nine tools and in bigger companies we can show that already this, we are cheaper than these nine tools you're replacing. But as well here, if you add more of the stuff and even if you don't pay for the license, the complexity that you add, you will pay for it one or the other way. Next thing is you can take care of your, the patterns yourself, but you have to. Here we are updating them for you. Take care of your physical updates yourself. For sure, through the patterns, it might be that you can regenerate parts, but here as well, we are updating already the physical structures, including data, so you don't lose any data if maybe we need to recreate the hubs because somebody invented the five, fifth hub column or stuff like that. In DBT, you're focusing on the data and you're going from the data upwards. Here, we're focusing on solving business problems and everything else downstream is generated. Here, you can do creativity. You get a lot of openness so your developers can really be create creative, but that comes at the cost because if every developer is creative, they create maybe different solutions for the same problem. And here we are on the standardized sites. Yes, it limits creativity, but it lowers development cost and time and it lowers maintenance cost over all the years. And yes, if you didn't experience pain in this area because you did a project before, this might be maybe not your main focus yet. Believe me, this is the much bigger point than looking like, like on license costs for a tool because this is what will cost, uh, cost, cost later in very huge number if you here need to maintain something that is maybe not that well documented, that maybe were the developers left and you need to recreate parts of it by different uh, developers. So here again, we're addressing here developers and data engineer here, bringing data engineers and business together is really the main point and saving total cost of ownership instead of focusing on lowering license costs. So this is how classical projects work. If you don't have tools covering many different functions, you need to do exactly that. You have an automation tool, but as it's not really doing the eat part, you need to have some ETL tool bringing the data in, stage it somehow, you need to create interfaces, you need to add data profiling tools, and you need to teach people in all of this tool. And Data Vault Builder's approach replaces all of that with one tool. We need to be honest, DBT as well reduces the la uh, landscape you are using here, but Data Vault Builder does it more. So these are the modules included. It starts with infrastructure setup, modeling, data profiling, code generation, testing, deployment, automating deployment, operation, and high availability, documentation, lineages generate, REST APIs are available, so we're covering the full process up as well to operations, logging, and everything. What most people concentrate on is model to code. And yes, this is what we need to migrate, but this uh, surrounding the model to code part is what you get with the data vault builder when you're finished out of the box because the model drives all of the other layers. So how does this look like? So we have the model that is used as communications mean between the business user and IT and Maybe you tried that before with some modeling tools that are not automating directly and then people printed out this model, created a PDF in fact, but tried to implement them. It took long, the IT needed to implement other stuff than was in the model because maybe the data didn't fit, business users needed to wait long and that was the reason why this whole approach failed. But here, now the business users with the IT sit together, they define what needs to be done and in the same moment, in real time, it's implemented, it's updated, the metadata is available in the correct version directly to the business users, and that's why this approach here works. 
So let's go to the more technical part. How to migrate now this stuff from dbt to data vault builder. First part will be we will extract the model, extract the metadata in fact, from the files we get from uh, automate DB, which are the basis for the dbt automation creating a data vault. Map this data to our model, what are hubs, what are links, what are satellites. I will demonstrate this that we don't have too much complexity in the demo just with hubs so you can follow really step by step on how to migrate hubs the next will be the link satellite and it can go really complex it could be that a migration in the real world takes a little bit longer but i just show you the basic approach how it works then we will generate a deployment package that's just a click of a button we will install what we have created in the data vault builder and then we would go and repeat the steps again and again to refine the metadata mapping of our source system to our target and the install package will show us then during deployment again and again what are the changes that we have done or are we going in the right direction or not. So let's jump into the live demo. So let's start here with our migration vault system. I have installed it here on my local machine. It runs on my Windows desktop because it's Docker based. I can deploy it on a Linux server. I can deploy it in the cloud or on my local Windows machine. And this local installation contains my model about metadata. And we want to load this element here, the hub. And the loads are already prepared. It's just that I don't have the metadata yet connected to it. As well, the business rules are there, how we derive IDs and stuff like that. That is already in our migration model. So the only thing that I need to do now is to go to the staging area and connect to my source system. And how I will do that? My idea is that I will use the files that I received from my model that I need to import and I will upload it to the server. So let's select now what I received. I go to my downloads folder and I need to unzip the files that I received, that's fine. And in the hubs list from the raw world I will now upload all the files and a few seconds later we have uploaded the files. And this file contain the description, which keys to use and what is the hub name, but in fact they just define here already what is the hub name because the composition of the key are in different files for the staging layer and we can look at that later, but for from this file we want to use here the names and create our hubs. That's the first step. So let's go in here and here we have created a source system connection and I'm connecting to this folder where I have put the files and I describe here that I want to load everything and I want to cut off the hub name itself in the file name, I will show you that again, that you understand what I mean. If you look here at the file names, they are called like hub underscore customer. And I don't want to import all of the files separately. I want to just import all of them, which starts with hub underscore and integrate them in one load called hub. And our driver is doing that if I tell him which part to cut off, which is everything after the underscore here. And this is what I'm saying here in the regex patterns. I'm pretty flexible how the names are. And now I go and I add this load. And it will create my target table and it will load it. So I can already have a first glance on if this is working, which kind of files have I loaded. By the way, I have ignored two ignore empty rows so as i selected to ignore empty rows so it loads because there are empty rows in these files and this could create the loader here to fail because it's checking if the data is there and we see now for the customer hub we got the different lines and we have the dbb row id so we know what belongs together 
So the next step is now we need to extract from that the names. And this is now done using SQL. So I can show you this here in my dbeaver. dbeaver is not related to the data vault builder directly. It is just a database client. And what I did here is I go to the table that I staged and I'm selecting now the hub name out of it, which is the file name without the hub underscore. And I get all the SQL code into one row if I want to here load more out of it and, and manipulate it. I don't need that for the hub. I will need it for the other files later on. And then I need to create a standard format, which is the object ID, if I have it. I don't have it yet because yes, I have one that I import, but this is the object ID that Data Vault Builder uses and we need to calculate it later. And if I keep it empty, we have a business rule that will fill it in the right format. The second thing is the imported hub ID because all the other metadata will refer to this hub later on. So this is where it links to. So we will import it with the key as it is right now. Um, then we will give it a name. There is no name information in this file. So I just do init cap to make a little bit of a nicer looking uh, name. I take the hub name as well as so-called Boyd. The Boyd is an the identifier without the H underscore part and here we will use the name already as coming from the source. I will have assign a subject to re-import it so I know later on in the model which parts I need to split up in different subject areas. There is no comment in the file and the object type is fixed to hub. So let's select this one and we get this nice format that we need for the next steps. So let's go in here back in the data vault builder and in my next step I do a double stage. I first stage the file in here that I have it in the database and then I do it here to use some SQL manipulations on the database that I can use my Postgres language that I prefer to, to using it from other connectors. I could have placed the logic already in the first load but then I don't see it on the database so I prefer in this special case now a double stage. It tells me that my source table is not yet there, that's perfectly fine because I just created it and I put in here my custom query and I execute it against my source, I test it, it validates that the column names that I want to have are here, that's perfectly fine, so let's load this as well and here we have taken apart all these manipulations of the files and the metadata that we get from the source. And now everything else is default because we already abstracted the source logic or the source way of describing this metadata. This means now all the loads here into the vault and everything on is already prepared. We just start the job and we start with the pre-stage. Then will the prepared metadata be loaded from that? And after that, the business world will derive the IDs and stuff like that. So let's start this load. Prepare metadata. Complete it as well. And now the business world is running. And this means if we go now back here into our hub hub and look in here what we have, we have now the list of hubs that we want to import. And the attributes are stored here coming from the raw vault. So this is what we really extracted from the files. This is the SQL that I showed you. And additionally, there was one new column derived by the business vault. And this is the so-called object ID. That's really an object ID in the format as data vault builder can use it with some special rules. It's always called H underscore depending on the target database is uppercase or lowercase and has omitted some special reserved characters. So let's go now to our interface. And in this interface, we can now join together this, the output that we need. This is done here already in this migration vault model. And now we go into the output and there is a business rule. And the business rule describes that now that all the columns that we have prepared shall be put into 
the special description format that we use for the deployment. So we could do here manual manipulations as well if we want to do something special, replace all the values with something. And that's fine. And now, because we will not only have the hub, I have created here one rule that will union then from all the different object types and put it into the output that we don't need to modify the output as well later on. And this is everything what we have done so far in the first steps that I described in the migration. So let's go in back in here to my migration presentation. So we extracted the metadata. There was some SQL involved. Then this is here what we deliver to you. Everything was done automatically. ID is derived and now I will generate the deployment package. And to do so, I have written a small script that we share as well with you in our knowledge base. And I switch back here to my demo environment. In the background, I let the script run. And the script generates me a migration folder, which I now can take to my demo environment. And just to show what we do, let's compare it against an uh, empty model, make it really empty. And now let's take a folder to import and I now take the extracted deployment information. It will show me what it will create. So we have exactly this information that we filled in and where we set default values select all and now let's deploy that So let's go back to the data vault and let's see what we have here. Let's put in everything and we have all the hubs ready and they're physically already implemented. So we could go now to the database and let's have a look at the database level that already in our demo database where I deployed now my data model in the data vault part, these hubs were created. and are ready to receive the data. So I have shown you now the migration of one data type, for sure, the most simple data type, but it applies for all the other objects as well. So where you have to work is you need to map your metadata format to our description, so the attributes that we need. Everything else is then converted and derived in here and the output is prepared, so that's done as well already in our migration vault model. You just run the script, extracting it into files, and then you can deploy the files in here, and you're done. What was created in the background is that already documentation is prepared, so we can just generate it. And we see here all our hubs that were imported. We can go to data lineage. And we see already where the hubs are in which layer we have no data connected so this will be added later and we can go and deploy it against the next environment so we really always when we finished one step are production ready for using this part already